All right. Just want to thank thank everyone for showing up here. It's a February 2023 version of our paper speaker series, Profiles and Research. Really excited to have this group of speakers on here. Um, I'm happy, excited for every year, but this particular one is special because it's really a grouping of friends and truly families. For those who don't know, Carol Davis is my mom, and this is the first time we've worked together in about 20 years, so I'm pretty excited <laughs> to have her here. Um, Patty is a personal friend uh, who we've worked with as well, and Susan, again, friend who we've worked through. You see a lot of friendship themes and uh, knowing each other here throughout this um, presentation. Uh, before we get started, I just want to do a quick, this is about PayPor. For those of you who don't know, PayPor is the uh, Pacific chapter of APOR, um, and we serve basically the entire western half of the United States, including Alaska. We push up into Canada, too. We're, we're very inclusive. On this call, we have people coming in from Germany and Texas and all over the country and all over the world, but our main central membership is from the Pacific uh, region. If you have any questions, if you're not a member yet, uh, go to you know, paper, paypor.org has more information or Jenny Benz, who is membership at paypor.org. It's extremely reasonable um, and it's a really nice group of people to be around. I, I feel my, I consider myself fortunate to be part of the paypor community. Um, these are some of our upcoming paper events subject to, you know, subject to COVID slash anyone who has any crazy ideas like, hey, let's have a happy hour in San Diego. We always like to get people together in different regions around our country to, to come and talk about research. Um, I also want to make an early, early pitch for our 2023 student paper competition. For those of you who know students out there, this is a really great way to get some money to participate in paper and get experience talking with the, with um, in front of your your peers here. And winner of the the winner of the competition gets two hundred fifty dollars in cash, but also a a trip up to San Francisco to our annual, our annual conference in December. I do want to say this: we we our sponsorship year runs by calendar year. And so we're starting up our, our sponsorship drive again for 2023, but I want to give a one final thank you to the sponsors from 2022. Uh, we run a very tight ship here. We are, we, we do, we lose money on our conference. We lose money on all our events and our membership, mainly because we just like getting people together and we, we wouldn't be able to stay uh, operate and offer the content we'd have without these uh, sponsors. And for if you have interest in being a paypor sponsor, please contact Ginger Blazer. She's in sponsorship of sponsorship at paypor.org. Again, there's information up here on, on our paypor website as well. All right. So uh now we that was the mandatory disclaimer at the beginning. And um now we're gonna have a little talk about each of our presenters here. I'm gonna ask each person to talk between 10 and 15 minutes. It's gonna feel rushed, it's gonna feel like, wow, how do you put years how do you put 20 plus years of research experience in 15 minutes um, but we will save we will have questions at the end you can type them into the chat or at the end of after after all the speakers i'll ask people to turn off the camera or turn the cameras back on and um and ask their questions so now give me a second here while i switch over to my uh my thoughts there we go Switch over to my next uh, speaker's presentation, Carol Davis. Yeah, um, so like I said, this is my sixth time doing a leading up a paper speaker series, and I'm really proud to have my mom here. She's a uh, you know obviously been a big factor in my life, and uh, also as many of you can anyone who's met her can attest to, she's a a character to 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 know. So uh, I'm going <laughs> to hand you off to to Carol and. Some of you, those of you who have not met her, who know me, you'll, who's, you know, I remember clearly getting into the research industry when people were going, oh, you're Carol's son. And then I remember taking her to a, a Insights Association conference years later, and I had the first person say, oh, you're Bob's mom. And it was quite the, 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 <laughs> the changing of the guard. So I'm going to hand you off to Carol. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, please either type them in the chat or save them for later. And with that, Carol, just give me a hey next slide when you're when you're done. I'm going to gently prod you on the on the timing. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Carol Davis. As you can tell from the first words out of my mouth, I'm a New York transplant. I'm the founder of Davis Research. Married 57 years, mother of two, grandmother of four. And uh, I started my company because not because I was a great, you know, 
person to break the glass ceiling, but because I was desperate to get some intellectual stimulation uh, being a house, a home mother. After retirement, I founded the uh, Savvy Senior Program. I'm on the Senior Advisory Board of Calabasas, and I'm the founder of the Caring Calabasas Club. Next slide. What I'm working on now, um, right now I'm working at the, volunteering, not working, at the Calabasas Senior Center. I'm part of the foundational team that established the Senior Center in Calabasas. Uh, Calabasas is a wonderful city, but they had no programs for seniors. So 11 years ago, I, along with another woman, approached the city and the city council, and we got them to build the building, the Senior Center. And I became a member of the advisory board, which I'm still on. And recently, during the pandemic, I, I started the Caring Calabasas Club, which is a charitable club where I get the seniors to make reading cards for foster children, blankets, things for the military, et cetera. Uh, I have a lot of passions. I didn't think I had any hobbies. When I was going to retire, my husband kept saying, you better find something to do because uh, you don't have any hobbies. Well, along came grandchildren. I like cooking, I'm making cards, I'm traveling. Uh, I take art history classes. I'm on the senior programming committee, meeting all new kinds of people. And I'm finally having fun. I mean, I'm decadently, we went to see 80 for Brady last week at the movies and out for lunch. I didn't have time for any of that when I was working, nor did I have time to play cards or anything else. Next slide. Uh, my education is I have a master of science in business. And I graduated, my whole education was all girls schools. In fact, all girls Catholic schools, which I realized when I arrived at NYU to the business school and only saw five other women, I realized I had been living in a very constrained environment but I was able to hold my own with the with all the men that I met at New York University in the School of Business. At the time I graduated from college, the only uh, big careers that women went into were teaching, nursing, and they got married. I didn't want to do any of those things. So I went to New York University by default and had a great career because I was in the, I was a dress buyer in New York City for seven years because one of my teachers was the personnel manager of a large buying office. And then when I moved to California after this exciting career is when I decided I better do something because really my mind was becoming fallow. And uh, I started Davis Research, which was a cottage industry at the time, data collection, data processing, coding. And before you knew it, uh, the government uh, said we can't be a cottage industry anymore. And so when people uh, had to obey the laws and do taxes, et cetera, many marketing research organizations fell out. But we persisted and are now passed it on to the next generation, which is a thing I am also very proud of. The organizations that I love right now are the Calabasas Savvy Senior Program. It's We've become a force in our city. And the Caring Calabasas Club, I got them to do a logo. Using my marketing background, the logo's up on the screen. We won an award nationally for the Caring Calabasas Club from the National Institute of Senior Center. So the marketing things that I learned were transferred to a volunteer program. The organizational skills that I learned, for instance, when I worked with Susan doing exit polls for the New York Times, we had to have 100 people in I don't know how many thousands of precincts for 24 hours, practically calling in results before they were big computers or handheld computers. That's all been transferred to a new skill. I made a new, a new career. There's life after marketing research. However, the skills that you learn uh, are transferable and really has put me ahead of the game. 
the picture on the bottom is the Calabasas Senior Center. So that's the building that was built because of our marketing, our persistence with the senior, the uh, city council. Uh, some of the pivotal moments in my life were I moved to California uh, and I had a, a new baby, a husband that was starting a career in uh, aerospace. He graduated from college at 30 because he had been in the service and then realized he had to go to college. So we we were struggling when we came to California. I had a new baby. I was leaving an exciting job. I was trying to be Wonder Woman and do all these things wonderfully. And I was having a problem. So I got help in my house. I had clients visiting me at home. I mobilized my neighbors. And before you knew it, Davis research happened. It didn't quite just happen, but it, it came into its full being. Uh, in 1976, my husband realized that he was making a presentation to a large group of people who were getting paid a lot more than he was. And he had the new idea and he was the low man on the total pole as far as the pay scale was concerned. So he decided to start the data processing end of our business. And that's when large computers were the only thing. The HP 3000 was the first computer that we bought. And we had to uh, put our house up as collateral. That was a very scary thing because by this time I had two children, one of which is now ready to become a savvy senior. And I don't have to tell you that there were many long nights doing data collection. The stories, I think I need to write a book, I mean, including going to a truck stop and asking truckers to come with me to the Holiday Inn and I was gonna pay them to do a survey on cabs for trucks. Well, you can imagine what they were saying. By the end, I was looking at the trucks and admiring how wonderful they were because they were owner operators. It was an exciting, busy career, raising two children, doing marketing research, having up to 100 employees, etc. Then I decided to retire. One of the big moving pieces that got me to retire was I started to have grandchildren and I realized I wanted to spend time with them. I also needed some new parts in my body, two knees, a hip, etc. And I got all that retrofitting, became bionic, and then decided I got to do something with the rest of my life. So I started the Calabasas Savvy Seniors and made a presentation to the city council and said, we don't have any time to buy any more green bananas. We need this building now. And I challenged them to build it in five years, which they did. Right now, over 2,000 people are coming to classes at least four semesters a year and there's 42 volunteers working to get this done with only two full-time people at the city who are mechanizing the uh, catalogs and so on. Then during the pandemic, I started carrying Calabasas and it hit a good uh, vein in people's lives. They, they were busy being selfish a little bit, doing things they wanted to do. And then they realized that paying it forward was a good thing to do. We don't collect money, we do deeds. Although we have now gotten some sponsors, for instance, Caruso Cares, which owns the mall right next to us, has become our partner. And they send the young people from Caruso to work with the seniors, for instance, stuffing teddy bears for Operation Gratitude and making, uh, up, making uh, paracord bracelets for soldiers and making cards for uh lost the children. So it's been a very, very rewarding thing. And then wish, winning the national uh, award was just the icing on the cake. Last week, I did a webinar for that, for the best practices. And now I have senior center directors uh, becoming my friend. Uh, and I'm giving them advice on how to market senior centers, applying my expertise there. It's been a lot of fun. Next slide. 
I wish I had more time to talk about cooking, carrying calabasas, my grandchildren. I look at foreign language Netflix shows at night, sometimes in the language with subtitles, and sometimes I dub it in English, but I'm learning about other cultures. I would love to travel more, but COVID has really put a little kibosh on that. I'm painting, making cards. I learned to play canasta, which is something I had never done before. I'm networking with large corporations like Caruso. And the next thing I'm going to do is call the Rams because they're moving into our area. And I can just see the picture of the football players stuffing teddy bears for Operation Gratitude. Watch it. Look out for it. I have lots of stories to tell about the good old days of survey research. Uh, Patty can tell you about the T-scopes. We did exit polls with Susan, did briefings in San Francisco, and then we went shopping at Macy's. We've become friends over the time. In the old days of marketing research, there were no phone banks. So poor Bob had to suffer. When I would go to a hotel or on a trip, I would take the phone book from the, the, the hotel because you couldn't buy phone books then and take it home with us because we would do surveys by giving random starting points in the phone book, counting down five names, skipping this name, going back, adding one. I can't even tell you what we did, but my luggage was way overweight. And poor Bob was mortified that I was stealing the phone books. Next slide. Uh, the four main things I would tell people is, don't try to be Wonder Woman or Batman or whoever you are. Don't be afraid to get help. Uh, you don't have to do it all. It was a lesson that I had to learn. I hated to ask for help. I wanted to do it all, but I just needed help. I needed help cleaning my house, watching my children. Uh, I needed an assistant at work, et cetera, et cetera. Your life is shaped by the calculated leaps of faith you take. I, I, I put the word calculated there because I have not been crazy, but I did put up my house as collateral for the first $100,000 computer that we bought, that's probably now $1.98. But at that time, it was a great leap of faith, but I had confidence in our ability to build the business. And you never know where you'll make lifelong friends. Uh, in the 10 minutes before this webinar, Susan, Patty, and I were just, oh, oh, it's so good to see you. We have to have lunch. It, it, it was very rewarding, especially when you're at my stage, which I'm retired now 17 or 18 years from marketing research, and I'm still applying my skills. And you're never too old to start something amazing. I feel like uh, when I worked at marketing research, although I was uh, helping our employees, I was, it was all business. This is a more um, social research, a social services thing that I'm doing. I know everybody in Calabasas. I can't even tell you, the mayor, the, the city manager. If I call them, they call me back. Uh, and it's become amazing. It's been famous in our city. So don't be afraid to start something new, uh, even in your career or after you're retired. I appreciate you listening to my story. This is one of my favorite pictures uh, which was at our birthday party for our son and his wife when they turned 50. And Bob had some magical camera. I don't know how he did this yet, but on some camera that can take a, a photo of us from the top. It's way beyond my comprehension, but I love it. Uh, anybody that can, can contact me, I still have an AOL email, which means all old ladies, just in case you didn't know. And it, because it's just too much uh, problem to change the email every place, I say I'm an early adopter of emails rather than AOL. Thank Thanks. you for listening to me, and I'm happy to. Uh, Thank you, Carolyn. And for everyone for growing up under Carol, I would get these little notes on my report cards or on my in my lunch, <laughs> and she would actually even when we when I first came to Davis Research, she would put these on employees' paychecks. So I want to give a little great job <laughs> sticker for you on your presentation so I can pay it, pay it That's back to you. That's a good one, Bob.
So there That's you go. a good one, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so great Thank job. You. Um, Thank I'm you. Gonna, now we're going to pass it over to, oh, sorry, I'm going to go to Patty as we're going alphabetical um, to Patty. And uh, again, if you have questions for, for anyone, we're going to have them at the end here. So, oops, sorry, Patty. It is. Carol, I absolutely love that picture of your family. <laughs> All right, Patty, for some reason, I lost the first side, which is, let me see if I can. Oh, there it is. Good. There you are. Oh, and so Patty and I have been, been friends through work and um, through the different career changes that she'll talk about. It's been it's been a nice friendship over the years that I did meet through through Carol. So I'm going to hand you off to, to Patty here. All right. Well, welcome. Or thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and thanks for taking the time. My name is Patty Freeze. And um, I have a few numbers here on the slide. And, and I guess so the main takeaway here is, is I'm a numbers person and I love statistics and I love data. Um, my dad was a engineering professor at the University of Nebraska, about 20 miles away from where I grew up in Wahoo, which is a town that most people don't forget the, the name of where I'm from, um, but a very small little rural community of about 3,000. Uh, he really encouraged me to be to be an engineer, um, and when I really wanted an Atari when I was a kid, um, he came home with a Commodore VIC-20 computer for me and said, that's great, Patty, if you want to play games, perfect. Why don't you program them yourself? Um, so thus, that was the start of um, my programming capabilities that I actually leveraged later on in, in marketing research. Um, but the most important thing about this slide is, is really the numbers surrounding the family. Um, I have a big family. Um, I have uh, 58 nieces and nephews. Um, I've been blessed with three sons who are now age 20, 18, and 15, um, and just uh, have, have really cherished uh, my family and, and the friendships that I've made along the way. Um, what am I doing now? My career, um, I started in marketing research back in, in 1994. And I spent several years on the supplier side. I don't like to call it the supplier side. I like to call it the partnership side um, of the business. And then uh, from there, I went and I spent 10 years on the corporate side at Dish Network, uh, building and operating the insights division at Dish Network. But now um, I've made another shift very recently, about two years ago, I've joined a big research organization in the heart of Denver um, called Market Once. And ROI is um, the component under Market Once that's the market research um, arm of, of the organization. We have lots of proprietary business to business and consumer panels, healthcare specialties, um, specialties in the automotive industry, specialties with um, people in various stages of their life, such as expecting mothers and those kinds of things. But one of the things that I really appreciate about our organization is that we're able to take it from the discovery phase of all of the research. And then we have sister organizations in e Accountable and DME Delivers so that we can take those insights and we can make strategic recommendations to our clients and really put those recommendations into play in both digital markets marketing um, and direct marketing. So it's it's kind of fun to be able to, you know, continue to have the ability to, to see the insights um, put to work and put to action. Um, my passions. So I mentioned my three sons already. Um, most of the passions really come from keeping up with your children, um, I, I have found. So whatever they love to do, I love to do um, because it allows me to spend some time with them. Uh, my sons are all very active in different sports, baseball, football, soccer, lacrosse. So I really enjoy um, watching them thrive both on and off the field. And, um, and then I really enjoy the things that I can do together with them, um, such as skiing down the slopes in Colorado. I'm, I'm based out of Denver, Colorado. Um, so I spend a lot of time, as much time as I can up in the mountains. Um, and then also wake surfing. We're not, we don't have the actual ocean waves here, but we can generate some waves behind a boat and, and have a lot of fun too. Um, but I would say my biggest passion overall is just 
the learning aspect, which was um, when, when you are the daughter of a professor, um, it's kind of ingrained in you very early. And um, it's one of the things that I've always cherished in my life. And you try and learn something every single day. Um, education. Uh, so definitely my family. I did attend the University of Nebraska. And from there, um, I chose to attend Thunderbird, which is a school of global and international management down in the Phoenix, Arizona area. Um, and it was really one of the experiences that I cherished the most. And I'll talk about it a little bit more on the next slide, so I won't go into too much depth. Um, but organizations I love, uh, I, I really love my team here at Market Once, and, and I think that that's really important, um, that when you find a career, you find people that you really enjoy working with. It makes all of the difference when you spend so much of your life um, at the office. Uh, University of Denver is an organization that I have um, spent a lot of time dedicating time, teaching some classes, going and, and interacting with the students there. So I really appreciate that. And then um, the Insights Association, um, I tend to be very involved in that. Um, I had the opportunity to be the keynote speaker at the Corporate Researchers Conference for the Insights Association uh, a few years back, and that was a fantastic experience as well. Uh, pivotal moments. So um, I'm a bit of a storyteller as well. So, so I'll take the opportunity to, to tell a few stories. Um, I think if we are all lucky in life, there's a few moments in time that, that really stick with you and inform um, some of your behavior throughout your life. And I was lucky to have one of those moments when I was 13 years old. Um, I was going to a middle school dance. And I remember that I was a, a bit mortified because I had learned that my father was going to be the chaperone at this dance. So I had told all my friends, I had given them all the heads up. I'm like, my dad's going to be here. And I was very good at that dance. And um, we had it in an auditorium and all the boys stayed on one side of the gym the entire time and all the girls stayed on the other side of the gym the entire time. And I was like, whew, like nothing happened, all great. I walk into my house that night and my dad sits me down on the couch. And for the first time in my life, he had told me that he was disappointed in me. And um, the follow up to that was that he said he was disappointed because I chose not to dance. And by choosing not to dance, I had missed out on the opportunity to have a memory from that particular night. So something that's always stuck with me, my oldest son's name is Caden, spelled C-A-D-E-N. If you rearrange those letters, it spells dance. So I try <laughs> I try and remind myself every day that, you know, take the time, make a memorable, make a memorable moment. Um, Thunderbird is my next thing that I have here. And I mentioned Thunderbird and, and my selection to go to Thunderbird briefly on the other slide. But being from Wahoo, Nebraska, there's not a lot of diversity um, in a town of 3000 people. And Thunderbird was really my chance to kind of have a trip around the world. Um, I was fortunate to be accepted to the school. Not very many kids that did not have any work experience were accepted, but I was able to get in. My starting class had 145 students, um, probably because I chose to start in the summer when it was um, 125 degrees in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, but we had 145 students and we represented over 92 different countries. So I really credit that experience. Um, as great as the teachers were at the school, I learned just as much from everyone around me that came from different cultures, that came from different backgrounds. And, you know, it's just really served me well in terms of, of managing teams um, and, and where everyone has different needs, different things that motivates them. Um, it's, it's just really been one of those experiences that I've cherished. Okay, and then I graduate from Thunderbird. I roll the dice 
and I take this job with a person who is starting up an advertising research firm for the first time and had zero clients. And um, my second week of work, I go to Calabasas and I meet Carol and Bob. And um, Carol and Bob were going to be our tabulation and data processing and coding partners. And they just really all, the entire family wrapped their arms around me and taught me everything that they knew about research. And, uh, and, and we gave it a good run. And I stayed at that company for 17 years. We built it up from a startup with, you know, finally getting one client in 1994 to, to working for companies like BMW and Wrigley and Miller Coors and New York Life and ConAgra and um, just really had a spectacular time. Um, Carol mentioned the T T scope story and um, back when we started the advertising research business, it was much simpler because there were really only TV and print ads to worry about. But we used to test um, print ads. We put them in a little histoscope with a slide and, and we used to have to test people's eye exposures and how quickly their eyes reacted to different print ads um, so that we could calibrate everything effectively and people could recognize an ad but not recall or learn anything from the experience. So anyway, I... I uh, I can share lots of those stories about some of those old methods of ad testing. But my, my most memorable moment from that entire experience over 17 years, um, and I would phrase it as believing in yourself. And when you're a small company, clients can kind of come and go. And sometimes we would lose clients for very arbitrary reasons. Maybe they got a new ad agency or maybe they got a new CMO. And um, there was one point in time where we pitched a big client, Fortune 500 client in New York, and he came to me afterwards, the, the CMO came to me afterwards and said, Patty, he's like, you got the job if, you got the job if you will register as a women-owned company. And um, I had a conversation with him and I reacted um, in that moment, which may or may not have been the smartest thing given that we really needed that client. Um, but I said, with all respect, um, I, I will be your partner if I'm the company that you select, regardless of whether or not we're a woman owned company. Um, but uh, I don't want that to be the reason that you select me. So he actually came back two weeks later and said, you know what, you're the best person for the job and I don't care if you register or not. And I didn't register, but two years later I did. Um, but that, um, that really gave me a feeling of believing in yourself and um, really being true to yourself. And giving me the confidence that later, when many, many times I was unfortunately the only female in an executive room, um, really gave me the confidence that I deserved to be there and, and that my voice should be respected. So that, that was an interesting um, opportunity for me. And then um, in 2011, I made another shift and I moved away from the research business and I moved into the corporate environment. And I took a job with Dish Network, located and based out of Denver, Colorado, a $14 billion organization that did not have any research or any insights and they were making all of their decision based on gut. Um, so I came in and I built a, a, an organization from the ground up there. Um, and uh, it, because there had never been a research team there before, I really built my own company based on building trust and building partnerships throughout that organization. And DISH, as you might imagine, a satellite company really over-indexed in rural America, which is where I was from, right? And, and the executive team um, primarily was from 
big cities throughout the country, throughout the world, and, and many of them had never even been to rural America, yet alone really understood our customer. So, you know, I took the opportunity and I did some very strategic work when I was at DISH and um, ended up coming up with some very strategic imperatives that really informed everything that we did to try and acquire and retain those customers and, and really make it an experience where you bring someone in and you wrap your arms around them and you want to hold them onto it to being your customer for forever. And um, because of that passion that I had for our customer and because of that understanding that I had for rural Americans, I was asked to actually take on the execution side of the business for DISH as well for rural America, which was um, ultimately 72% of the business. So it was really an opportunity for me to move the, from the research side to the execution side and, and really helped me to kind of put those insights into action. But I would say it was, it was really that passion for rural America and that passion for the consumer and that passion for connecting with them in a meaningful way, which I did through country music, which is actually, you know, also a fun thing um, for me. But it, it was that passion that I had that gave me that opportunity. Um, and then th the next one I would say is, is yet another move. Um, I really loved my work at DISH. I really loved everything that I was able to impact. Um, but I found some things in the research industry where um, some of the quality of the data when, when DISH went to acquire Boost Mobile, for instance, I had all of this due diligence work and I started looking into the validity of some of the data that was done by some of these research partners and some of the quality just wasn't there. And, um, and I felt like I needed to help um, and, um, and, and I needed to make sure that I went to an organization that I truly believed in and that really stood for, for quality. Um, and I had done some work with ROI Rocket when I was at DISH and they are, uh, you know, one of, I know everyone really, you know, stands behind their work, but the ROI Rocket was one of those firms that had a hundred percent guarantee in, in their work and really backed it up and, and read every single open-ended response and, you know, really had validated panels. So, I really believed in in what they were doing, and um, and I had thought about going out on my own, um, honestly. And then um, ROI reached out to me and asked me if I would consider um, having a leadership role in their organization. So it's it's been a fun journey um but i would say you know the the main takeaway is you know when, when we make these changes in our careers uh look very closely spend a lot of time with the people who you're going to be working with and that you are working with and make sure that you have a lot of confidence and and that you um, are a true believer in in the products that's being offered it it makes the day-to-day -day a heck of a lot easier when when you believe in that uh, wish I had more time to talk about. I've, I think I've highlighted it, all of these um, with the exception of maybe my favorite country song. So I'll tell one more quick story about that. Um, being from Nebraska, I've always grown up around country music, um, supporting rural America. Um, I think country music has some nice storytelling capabilities that you can really grab onto. Um, and it, I used country music as a way to kind of help tell a story of shared values between an organization, um, and a brand and its consumers. So, um, I have a lot of favorite country songs, but my favorite one is probably with Dirk Bentley, a song called I Hold On. And it's really a song about, you know, holding on to the things that are most dear to you in terms of your family and your friends. Um, and so it's it's a great it's a great takeaway as well. 
Um, on my first slide, I had mentioned that I had shots with 19 country music stars, and Dirks Bentley is certainly one of them. <laughs> uh, so to, to just kind of summarize, um, I tell the story about the dance and my dad. So just taking the chance to make every day memorable. Thunderbird, um, it was the students and not just the teachers who really surrounded me with knowledge and learning. So all of those around you, um, soak it all in um, because we're all teachers. Um, believing in yourself, you know, the story about being firm and saying, I want to be the best choice. Um, it, it makes you feel really great about yourself if, if you can have that belief. Um, DISH, my experience was really about being passionate and, and having that passion open up unexpected doors that would help give me my next opportunity um, in my career. And, and then, you know, quality and, and believing in the people that you work with and, and the product that you're offering. And, and that's, that's, that's the story. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. I'd give you a sticker, but I hadn't planned one for you either, but so sorry. But thank you very much for sharing your story. All right. Our next speaker is going to be Susan Pincus. And again, I met Susan on my one of my early jobs was a was a uh, exit polling for for the LA Times. I worked exit polling, intercepts, I did uh, precinct counts. And uh, I did some other research, but I don't think it was for LA Times, it wasn't for you though, Susan. But I but I will say, and hopefully this theme will come out, it was growing up, I realized um, watching my mom in business and I was trying to understand, is this her client or her friend? And I didn't understand that you can be both and, it's, and it works even better when, when, you're, when they're both. So now I'm gonna pass off to Susan. Thank you, Bob. And, you know, Carol and I were expats from New York, so we we have each other's sensibilities. And I loved your mom. And she was a great, she was great. I mean, organized, responsible, made sure that everything was right. Um, I really enjoyed working with her. But thank you for having me. And um, it's hard to follow Carol and, and especially Patty. Um, one word that really kept coming up to me, and I'll talk about that later, is about passion. It's not so much that you you have a job, but that you're passionate about what you do, and you don't mind going to work, even though it could be 24-7. Uh, you just enjoy doing it. Anyway, um, I am the former director of the LA Times Poll. And I was with the paper for about 30 years. I don't think that ever happens anymore. But, uh, I, but I was there for a long time and I worked my way up to become the director. I started as a field supervisor. Um, I am the lifetime, I'm a lifetime honorary member of APOR. Uh, I was on APOR council for three times. And the last one was conference chair, which was great. I had a great time doing that. And um, I reactivated the Payport chapter, which I am so happy to say is thriving. And kudos to all that have kept it going. Um, I am not related to Aaron Pincus, but I maybe, we don't know. We'll have to have lunch and figure that one out. Um, and I've guest lectured. Um, I've been an adjunct professor. Um, and I've been on panels, I've been on TV news shows. So it's been a complete ride for me. I've had, I had a great time. Um, next. What I'm currently doing, um, up until the pandemic, I did, um, vol I did uh, consulting work. I had my own company, it was S.H. Pincus Research Associates. And I did a lot of consulting work. I helped uh, create the the poll for um, the Pat Brown Institute at Cal State LA. I worked for Maria Shriver, Maria Shriver when she was the first lady of California. Um, and then the pandemic came and I did a lot of political polling as well, but then the pandemic came and um, I decided to take a break. 
um, from working at in polling um, times. Things have changed in polling a lot. Um, after the 2008 election, it got really heated and I'm so happy I didn't have to do Trump election polling. Uh, that put years on my life, I think. Um, what I'm currently doing, I'm a volunteer in an organization that does work on social justice issues. While I was working for the paper, I really couldn't get involved in any uh, kinds of volunteer work that involves social justice or work for the city of where I lived. I had a, um, resigned from a lot of boards and a lot of uh, volunteer work that I did because they would consider it a conflict of interest. So I had to give up on a lot of things. But I did when I when I um, started my own company and when I retired, um, I working on a vol in an organization that does work on social justice issues such as economic justice, gun control, guaranteed income, women's reproductive rights. That to me is a uh, the most important reproduct women's reproductive rights. What the Supreme Court do did was pretty horrible. Anyway, I was on the Journalism Advisory Committee at the University of Albany. That's where I graduated from. They wanted to make journalism a major in the school. So I helped them um, get it. They had to go through the state legislature, New York State Legislature, because it was a state university. Um, so I helped them uh, get journalism as a uh, major in in school. Um, and until this year, I was on the executive council board of the Roper Center for Public Opinion Research. I was on it for a very, for a very long time. I finally decided to leave. I felt that it was time for new blood. I wanted younger people to be involved in this. And so um, with bittersweet with a bittersweet feeling, I, I left the board. I am still involved, but I'm not on the board. And I was on other boards as well um, for the marketing and public research firm. I was on the Women's Council. Um, I was on the National Council of Public Polls um, and on many other things. My passions outside of work was, is the theater. I love the theater. I go to New York. Before the pandemic, I was going two or three times a year to New York to see Broadway plays, the ballet, um, concerts, um, reading good books, um, spending time with my friends. When I worked for the paper, it was basically 24-7. I had, as, um, as Carol said, you know, I had to come up with hobbies. I didn't have a hobby when I worked because I worked all the time. So I had to figure out what I liked and what I liked to do. And basically, I like to do traveling. I've traveled all over the world, every continent but Antarctica. That's, that's the next stop. Um, but uh, reading is really uh, a favorite of mine, too. I like to sit quietly by myself and read. Uh, next slide. Uh, I went to State University of New York in Albany. I had a BS in business education with a minor in art history. Um, when I went to college, you know, our high school had guidance counselors, which really didn't help in any way. They didn't tell us what was out there for us. Um, and as Carol said, was either a nurse or a school teacher, or a secretary. Uh, we didn't know what else was out there. Nowadays, women have so many more things to think about what they want to do, so many creative things which we never had. So I became a school teacher in high school, Abraham Lincoln High School in Brooklyn, New York, for six months. I didn't last too long. Uh, I hated it. But anyway, that was my major, but it was in business. And then I went to Baruch College, which is the City University at, of New York at Baruch, um, for postgraduates for an MBA in marketing advertising. Um, and I took 
through APOR conferences. I took the short courses that they authored. Authored. Um, I audited a lot of methodological courses. At the times, I brought in statistic professors to teach us a, about statistics, auditing statistics classes. I wasn't very good in math. So, I mean, I had a lot of um, tutors to help me along the way. Um, thank God for computers. They do most of the work the, the, these days. Um, and the organization, organizations you see that I love are a lot of them in the industry, APOR, of course, PAYPOR, RAP, which is the Women's Reproductive Rights Assistance Project. And that group um, uh, gives money to women who um, don't have any money to uh, go to get an abortion. So they'll give them um, daycare for their kids. They'll give them a bus ride to an abortion clinic. They'll help them in any way they can. Planned Parenthood, World Wildlife Foundations. I love elephants. I've been to Africa and we have to keep our animals alive. Habitat for Humanity. Um, the NCJW, which is the National Council of Jewish Women in LA, but they do more than just Jewish projects. They work on um, a lot of um, work in LA City, LA County, and helping the homeless, um, giving money to, um, to, to students to go to college, et cetera. And I also did a lot of work in my local community where I live. Um, so I've been on a lot of commissions in my, in my, um, where I live. I, I have always been an activist, so this just helped me. My pivotal, pivotal moments, um, when I left teaching, I always want, thought I wanted to go into marketing advertising. So in, I lived in New York, I lived in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and I worked in various advertising agencies. Um, and then I um, worked for a marketing research company. I was the coding supervisor. I don't know if there's still such a thing that exists anymore. Um, so I learned a lot about coding and a lot about um, field supervising, etc. cetera. Um, and then in 1977, I moved to Los Angeles um, and I found a an advertising job as well. And I was there for about a year. Actually, I moved to uh, L.A. in 1975 and 76. And then I worked for an ad agency for about a year and a half in L.A. And then I was reading the classified section of the L.A. Times uh, you can see how old I am since we had a classified section. And there was a job there for um, a marketing research assistant in their business department, spending 50% of my time in that job. And then in a newly created Los Angeles Times poll as um, a field supervisor. And I'm wondering, could I do this job or not? I, I, I didn't know. So I had a friend that worked at Benton and Bowles. He was the marketing research director. And I called him up and I said, do you think I can do this job? And he's, and I read him the description of the job. And he said, absolutely. He goes, I know the marketing research director there. I'm going to call him. He called him. He got me an interview. I had two interviews there and I got the job. So that was definitely a pivotal moment in my life. Um, I had no idea what a poll was, an LA Times poll. I've heard of the Gallup poll. I heard of the Harris poll. But I really did not know what that entailed. So um, I got the job and I knew about what a research, marketing research assistant was. So I did a lot of work for the... Um, advertisers of the paper and a lot of it were malls and shopping centers and whatever um and then 
I became the field supervisor and I was the only one at the paper that was on the LA Times poll. My boss at the time worked for the Roper organization and he worked part-time doing the poll. So whenever there was a poll, he would he he lived in New York, he would fly out to LA and we would do the poll together. And our boss boss was the assistant managing editor who was basically like my mentor. He was a wonderful man. Um, and then 1980 rolled around and that was a, a presidential election year. And so I was on loan to the editorial department for a year. So I left the business side of the paper and spent the year in editorial going to the conventions, doing exit polling, doing national um, election polling, doing California state election polling, did a lot of work, as you can see, on election time during the, during the 1980 election. 1981 came around and I begged, I absolutely begged the um, assistant managing editor to transfer me full time to editorial, which he did. And that was basically the start of my career in, in, in polling. So I did um, field super, I did the field work. Um, I wrote manuals. I trained the interviewers for the exit poll. I work with Carol Davis. She did the California um, state exit poll. And when we did the national exit polling, uh, she did the Western regional area of the of the country. We were the only um, uh, group or the only paper that did exit polling apart from the network polling that had the consortium of papers and uh, TV um, TV stations that did the polling. So there were the two of us, which was really great because we could compare notes and see how well we were doing. So I would fly to the different um, states that we did exit polling. I, I, we started out with um, the Iowa caucuses, then we went to New Hampshire, then we went to South Carolina. So we did alone, we did about six or seven pivotal states for the exit poll. And then at the in November, we did a national exit poll. And so I would have to get um, uh, marketing research companies or field companies in different regions to get um, um, interviewers to reach out to reach um, the whole uh, country. So we did that and I was the field, a field supervisor for a while, I think about four or five years. And then I got promoted to the assistant director. And with that, I helped, you know, write the questionnaire, do the research for the, for the questions, work with the reporters. Um, and went into deputy director and then in 1996 became the director of the paper. What I liked about that was I always called my department the generalists and the reporters and the editors, the experts who had the had the beat um, that we were doing the poll for. It was a great collaboration. We did really well. The reporters really respected my, my department um, we were right for the exit polling. We were right, you know, I would say 98% of the time, um, we lost the New York Senate race one year. We were wrong one year. Um, but we did really well. And not only did we do national polling, but we also worked with different sections of the paper. Um, we did entertainment, we did sports, we did, um, the different sections, the different local sections, like Orange County, the San Fernando Valley. Um, we did um, special polls, like we did polls of, um, we interviewed um, 
priests and nuns. That was an interesting sample that we had to pick um, during the child sexual abuse scandal. We did the O.J. Simpson trial. I did a poll among American Jews and I got um, an interviewing company in Israel to do um, Israeli Jews for their 50th anniversary of Israel. I did a poll among American Chinese and I got a, a company to do in Hong Kong to do a poll in 1997 when Hong Kong was being taken over by China. Um, and we did poll, we did two huge polls during the AIDS crisis, just about AIDS. We did a huge poll just about abortion. And so we did a lot of polls on social issues. But, you know, but we did a lot of polls on on um, on elections and political. But we also did California State. We did local polls. We did the mayoral exit polling or mayoral polls in L.A. City. So we did a lot of work. And as I said, it was my passion. I absolutely loved it. Um, and then I left after the presidential election in 2008 not because I wanted to, I guess in a way I wanted to, but I didn't, but I saw the writing on the wall that the LA Times was laying off a lot of people and the paper was not doing that well. And so I felt it was the time to leave. And then I started my own company um, and did, you know, interesting work. I just picked and picked and chose the ones I wanted to do. Um, I didn't work too hard, but I did do lots of interesting, lots of interesting research. Um, and then the pandemic came about and that really was tough. You know, it was just tough. Um, and I uh, sort of stopped working in 2020 and said, I'm tired, I don't want to work anymore. And so I do a lot of volunteer work and um, and whatever. Next, uh, I wish I had more time to, um, oh, travel. What is this? Uh, well, that's what I did. And then um, to talk more about travel, I traveled all over the world. Um, about the Roper Center, they do such great work. And as both Carol and Patty say, follow your passion. Don't consider your job a job that you go in from nine to five or whatever, whatever however time you work. Consider it your passion, what you love to do. You will never consider it your job. Passion, I think, is the operative word here. And a lot of reading, I'm doing a lot of reading. I like to do a lot of nonfiction reading. Um, and um, things to take away. I, I, I remember I was in a USC class. It was the beginning poli-sci class. And, you know, we were talking about working and, and they were asking questions. And to me, I always felt that you can never accept no for an answer the 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 key word for me is persevere never give up if that is what you want if that it may take a while but i would tell you to keep on plugging along and just work at it really hard and just persevere do not take no for an answer and have confidence in yourself um i find i think it's important to find a mentor if you can um, they can really help you, guide you, especially if you're new to the business. They can explain a lot of things to you about how to act politically and what's what's the right way to say something and teach you a, about, about what you're doing. Um, and I always say surround yourself with smart people because they make you look smarter. Um, and don't be threatened by them. You can you can learn a lot. I mean, I am not a methodological person, but I surrounded myself with people who were. And if I didn't know anything, 
I had a lot of friends that I can call and say, can you explain this to me? Tell me this. But I had a gut feeling. I knew, I felt it. I knew if something was right or wrong. And we would look into it and check it out again and again to make sure that the sampling was right. The rep, you know, it was a representative sample that the methodology was right. So, I mean, that was important. What I did was also in in um, the last few years of the poll, we coast we worked with Bloomberg, and I worked with Bloomberg um, doing polling for them. Um, and one thing that we did was uh, no polling article ever got into the paper until we edited it to make sure everything they said was accurate, that they weren't embellishing or looking at the, the data in the wrong way. We sent out press reports. We, um, give, we gave analysis to the reporter so that they could look at it. We talked to them. We made sure that they understood everything that was going on. Um, and I would say be kind to everyone and generous to those who work for you. You never know if they'll become your boss one day. <laughs> Plus everyone at some point can help you. Just because they're in a lower position than you, it doesn't matter. Everybody matters. And my last thing is to be truthful and honest. Lying will come and bite you in the butt. It may not be today, but there's always tomorrow next. And uh, thank you for listening to me. And I put this picture up because that was the first concert I ever went to when the Beatles first came to the United States. I think it was in 1963 or 64. Um, I got to go. But notice all seats reserved $4.50, $5 and $5.75. Meanwhile, I just bought a ticket for $250. So, I mean, for a concert, how awful, right? But anyway, that's my story. And I have so much more to say, but not enough time. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thank you for listening. All right. Thank you very much, Susan. Now I'm going to ask Carol, Patty, and Susan to turn on. In fact, everyone can turn on their cameras at this point. Um, Two, we're going to ask some questions if you feel comfortable. We want to, uh, I'm going to see if I can do this here. Uh, spot allowed a multi pin. Let's see if I can get this here. Um, all right. So, yeah. So, thank you very much. We have plenty of time here for questions and answers. That was an amazing experience. I've, I've got a lot of uh, really takeaways here, both as, you know, for myself and also as I think about the messages I send to my kids. Um, would anyone, does anyone have any questions out there? While we're waiting for the, for that, I do have a question for each of you, which is, there's just, well, if you've seen the movie, uh, it's up for best picture right now, every, you know, everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> and it really kind of talks about pivotal moments in life, how, you know, we call them the sliding door moments. Like if something had gone a different way, my life would have been different. Do each of you have uh, a specific sliding door moment that you felt was, uh, was we talked about these things, but what if uh, it could have gone the other direction? Well, for me, it is, what if I didn't go to California? Um, I went there for a personal reason. Um, it was my impetus to always go to California. I always wanted to live there. You know, it was during the um, the hippie days <laughs> and flowers in your hair and all that kind of stuff. So I always wanted to go to California and it just happened. It was a, uh, I, I guess I put it out there in the universe and it happened that I, I came to California and it was a personal reason, but because of that, I got this job. And I have to say, I don't know if I should say it, but the last job I had in advertising in California, I was fired. Don't know why. 30 years later, I'm talking to some friends of mine who worked at this agency and they said, you don't know why you were fired? And I said, no, I don't. Tell me because it's still on my mind. I've never been fired in my whole life. And 
she said this woman in the company was dating the owner of the agency and she wanted my job. Wow. And that's how it happened. Right now, I guess I could have gotten a big uh, lawyer <laughs> going, but back in 1976, it wouldn't, 77, it wouldn't have happened. But out of something bad came something good because I would have been stuck in that job and I didn't even really like it. I mean, I thought I wanted advertising, but who cares about orange juice and head and shoulders and all that <laughs> stuff? I wanted to do something that was for the better good of the of the con country or whatever, what I was doing. So it happened. As they say in Judaism, it was bershert. It was meant to be. It was preordained for me to do it. So Hi, how about you? Um, I would say for me, I mean, it was really kind of the choice to go and, and leave Nebraska and leave my comfort zone and go to school in Arizona and go to Thunderbird and get that experience. It just really opened my eyes to so many different cultures and so many different perspectives that I've just um, so appreciated and, and taken with me throughout my life. And Carol? I would say moving to California too. I didn't move for any reason except to be supportive of my husband. In those days, you're supposed to be, you know, supportive of your husband. But then I realized I have to take care of me too, because I'm just not going to be a good wife or a good mother if I feel suffocated. So moving to California was a very big thing. And then I was able to start my own business. But it was a scary thing to leave my whole family and so on so i would say that was very pivotal and as well as looking into nyu and seeing that i was only one of five people and the only one from new york the only woman from new york and i realized that i had I was standing most of the people were older than i was and had been to business school i was in liberal arts major so when i held my own and came out second in the class at, at this big place, you know, it was, it gave me a lot of confidence. Also, I think when I was in college, my roommate was from the Philippines mm -hmm. and I went home and with her, I went to the Philippines. It was my first airplane trip was at 21 years of age, you know, 28 hour plane trip. And I was able to function in another country for the first time. And that made me also have a lot of confidence in myself, what Patty was saying before, to, to get a feeling of uh, self-confidence is very, very important. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions out there? Uh, one one did come into the question. chat, which was, when do you sleep? <laughs> it specifically <laughs> don't ask this about Susan, but I believe that everyone, I haven't hearing all of the things going on in Carol and Patty's life too. You know, do you have a quick advice for anyone who's like, you know, it's great to do all these things, follow your passion and read and travel and raise kids and be a wife or a husband. And what's, what's the advice for you is when we realize you're still 24 hours in a day? I'll jump in. I mean, I, I think you have to have partners, right, that support you. So I've been very blessed ever since I moved to, to Colorado and taken on the role at DISH. Um, my husband was police officer and an adrenaline junkie, and he raised his hand and said, I will stay home with the boys. And it was supposed to be a six month thing and it has been a 12 month thing. Um, but having that partnership and having somebody that you can lean on, um, no one can do, I think, you know, we, we said it several times today, but you can't do everything yourself. And, um, you know, just having that partnership of friends, family, wife, spouse, sisters, whoever it is. Um, give yourself a little bit of a break and um, and make sure that you're not putting the weight of everything 
on your shoulders and, and give yourself a break. If, you know, if you're not a hundred percent at everything, some stuff is going to slip. So you just do the best you can. Dad. Excellent. Um, well, if there's any, no other questions, I, one of the things, the key takeaways I hear, we're going to write this up in our newsletter here, which uh, Sam, that's you, right? You're in charge of that. Some of the common themes I heard here, which I love, following passion, taking those calculated risks and volunteering to just be on your more than just the job you do. And, you know, then just networking, volunteering and helping each other out. This is I love the different stories that how those themes manifest themselves in your life. So I do want to take say thank you to very much our speakers here for uh, for being part of our paper profiles and research um, if if you missed any of the previous ones, many of these have been recorded. Um, they're available here on our website, paper.org, and you can see some of our other speakers uh, in the in the past. And um, just again, thanks everyone for participating, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thanks, great, Bob. thank you, Bob. Thank you, thank you, Bob. That was great. Carol, then Bob, nice to spend some time with you. Thank every, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank Carol, you. We gotta do this more often. <laughs> Carol, I'll call you.